I was thinking about that as in what we have to today. So it's pointless. It's just a Yeah. Okay. So today we're gonna we're gonna do some review for the exam, which is this time next week. On chapter ten and eleven. All right. So, any specific? Let's take them uh, one chapter at a time. How about chapter ten? Do you have any trouble that we need to deal with before I start talking? Uh, maybe you need to get like a family calculation ones. Okay, pick one. Um, I haven't had a chance to look through it yet. Let's look at this one. So far, I'm understanding like the diagram with the phases. Mm -hmm. I understand that a little bit. Okay. Uh, okay. Substances, these A through B, involve no bonding forces except London dispersion. Uh, only London dispersion. Okay, that's what we're looking for. So our choices are sodium chloride in the liquid form. What does that mean? Very hot, <laughs> among other things. HF in the liquid form. C in two solid form. And K potassium metal in solid form. All right. So what do we know about London dispersion? The weakest and it's very, it doesn't stay forever in those ways. Right. <clears throat> London dispersions are, are very weak. So, when. Yeah. There's a. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Yeah, I did skip this one. Okay. Now recap. <laughs> we do know that London dispersion forces are the weakest. Um, but the question is, um, do they ever go away? Yes. Oh, I mean, no. But I mean, they don't, the two they don't stay together forever. That's true. But the London dispersion attractions are always present for everything. The question is, since they're so weak, are there other forces that are just massively more important than they are? Yes. Yeah. And it depends on the uh, situation. So, what attractions are there between sodium and, well, we would say, what happens to sodium and chlorine when we liquefy it? Or become well, when you put energy into it, think of it in terms of the bonds. Right. Right. When it's solid, you have sodium ions, chlorine ions attracting one another, and they're in a regular crystal lattice. When you liquefy it, 
you've weakened those bonds so that now those ions slide past one another. But do the, uh, what kind of forces are we talking about? Ion. Right. We're talking about ion to ion attraction. So when we, when we heat up sodium chloride solid, we're weakening those bonds, but we're not breaking them entirely. They're just weak enough so that they can slide past one another and move, right? But they're still there. And they're still much stronger than one. Right? So this one can't be it. These forces are just too strong. We don't have only one in that one. How about HF? It's hydrogen bonded, so I don't know. Right. Um, Right, because hydrogen bonding is much stronger than London dispersion, right? Okay, how about N2? What attractions? Well, what is N2? Is it covalently bound uh, dinitrogen molecule, right? Okay, so are there any dipoles here? I say yes. How could there be dipoles if nitrogen and nitrogen are identical? Right? You don't get any uneven distribution. Right? So there are no dipoles. There are no ions. Right? So what's left? That's it. That's the only thing active. And since we don't have all of the above, none of the above, two of the above, whatever, if you're in the middle of a test, that's where you stop. Yep. What, uh, I just want to ask you, Gary, would H2O be hydrogen and dipole-dipole since it has two anions? Actually, it's a special case of dipole. Ah. Uh, hydrogen bonding. Uh, right. So both of these are hydrogen bonding, which is a lot stronger than London. How about K? But we didn't spend a lot of time on the type of bonds for uh, metals metals but this metallic bonding actually we did spend a little time last semester on um, molecular bonding and metallic bonding is uh, I think at the tail end of our chapter 10 discussion <clears throat> there was mention of metallic bonding being best explained in terms of molecular orbitals. Right. Because as you get more and more and more atoms that you can use to combine into metal, um, molecular orbitals, the energy gap between them becomes vanishingly small. So that means that those valence electrons in their outer shells can easily jump from one molecular orbital to the next. That's why they conduct electricity, they conduct heat very efficiently. But it's still the bonding is much, much stronger than London dispersion. And it's permanent, right? These are all permanent, 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 permanent. These are transient. That's why they're so weak. So the answer to that one is C. Okay. You mentioned what four and four and five. Uh, I meant on the like the back. I'm sorry. The back. The first and depth tool part. On ten, chapter ten, the very back of the study. Line. Oh, oh, we're going to the yeah, the calculation, the tail end. Yeah. Oh, is that the way to? Did I did I not number them sequentially? No, it's like I like how you set it up. It's like easy, moderate, and difficult. Okay. There's moderate. Ah, oh, there's difficult. Yeah, I meant like that too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. These. Um. Right. <laughs> this was. These were created in a in a bygone era, so the numbering is not sequential, except within difficulty. 
Okay, so let's see. Where am I? There's moderates. And here's difficult. Okay. So which one do we want to look at? Could we look on to this one as well? Because uh, could we do a Q? Why is Q? Yeah, two on the Say that again. Could we do chromium? Uh, sure. Yep. Yeah. So this is chapter. This is a difficult section. I gotta be more specific than donut. Difficult section number two. Okay. Chromium metal crystallizes as a body centered cubic lattice. So, chromium metal crystallizes as a body centered, body centered cubic lattice. Okay. So if the atomic radius of chromium, so the radius is equal to 1.25 angstroms, what's the density? The question is density. What do we need to know to calculate density? We need to know the mass and the volume that that mass occupies. Okay. So, if this is our uh, unit cell, we need to know what's the volume of that unit cell. Right? So, the volume is going to be uh, whatever uh, a side is cubed. We need to know the side of that, that unit cell. We need to know this here because it's the same for all three dimensions. So, is there a formula that will tell us that if we know this is a body centered cube? There will be Andrew something for that. Right. We're going to have we're going to have chromium atoms at each of these corners. Then we're going to have one right in the middle. Right. So let's see, the formula for that, the edge length, this is the edge length. Right. And the edge length is going to be this formula. And that formula should be um, in useful information. Let me be sure it's there. Four thirds. There it is. BCC edge for R uh, divided by square root of three. Okay. I see Zach Carpenter's name. I don't see Zach Carpenter's picture. Are you there? Unmute, unmute yourself. Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Do you not have a video available? Um, you go to start video, I guess. Yeah, try that. There you go. Okay, let me mark you down as present. Okay. Okay, so we're on uh, chapter 10 in the difficult section number two. We're trying to find the density of chromium with the information given. It's in a body centered cube, and the radius of chromium is 1.25 angstroms. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, before we go any further, what are the standard units of density for solids? Do you remember? Uh, grams over centimeters. Right. So this would be grams, and this would be cubic centimeters. Okay. 
So it might uh, make things easier if we were to convert this to centimeters, right? Because the radius is going to give us this edge length. And if we do it, if we convert that to centimeters first, then when we put it in our formula, our answer will come out in centimeters. So what is an angstrom? Uh, one angstrom is 10 to the negative 8 centimeters. Okay. Well, if you want another one. So. That's fine. 10 to the minus 10th meters. And if we apply conversion from meters to centimeters, that makes it 10 to the minus 8. Right? Okay, so we can go ahead and use that. One angstrom is 10 to the minus 8 centimeters. Right? So that's a pretty simple calculation, isn't it? 1.25 times 10 to the minus 8 centimeters. That's the radius. That's the value that goes in here. Okay, divided by the square root of three. So what does that give us? That gives us the edge length of this cube. And then we can use that to calculate the volume. Then we have a value for that right there. Okay, what's the square root of three? I got 2.886 from bottom to the negative. Times 10 to negative 8. 2.8 what? 2.886. Times 10 to negative 8. Uh, 7 meters. Okay. Does anybody else get that? I'll show you here and see. <laughs> Double check our word here. Okay, and I did some more on the Yep, I got that too. So we got two to the degree. Okay, so, um, Let's leave it like that. You remember why? We don't round yet. Rounding error. If you round multiple times during a calculation, you're liable to end up with a final number that's skewed way off one way or the other, depending on the roundings. If you round up and down, up and down, up and down, the likelihood of that is, is small. But if each time you round, it goes up, 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 you go be way off at the end. So we'll keep that number and we'll plug it in here. A cubic. So let's see. Not yet. 2.40563 times 10 to the minus 23rd centimeters. Agreed? Okay. So now we've got this value identified. What we need is, is mass. So if this is the volume, how do we determine the mass? If we know how many atoms are represented by this unit cell, then we can use. No, that's used. This is the chrome We know it's chromium, right? So when we take the mass of chromium. Right, the molar mass of chromium is fifty-one point point zero zero. 52.00. I'm going to have to temporarily shift this over like that. Yeah. All 
rounded to two places. And this is grams per mole. Okay. Now, yeah, go ahead. Then we take that, take grams, that we basically put it over. Once we find out what grams is, oh, oh, this is grams per mole. We will use it, yes. But I'm interested first in how many atoms are in that unit cell. How many are represented here in that unit cell? So how much of that one? Oh, one half. Oh, one eight. One eight, right. Oh. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Two, four, six, eight. So that's one. The corners represent one, and then the center represents the second one. So you've got two atoms per cell. Two atoms per cell. Okay. So <laughs> we've got two atoms per cell. We want to know what mass that is. So we've got two atoms. How many moles does that represent? Actually, six point oh two two times two to the one third atoms per mole. Right? We got rid of atoms. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. What do you mean by two atoms per cell? Oh, what do you mean by that? Do you assume like every unit cell has two atoms? Yes. Every unit cell represents two atoms because we've got an eighth here times eight. And then this one hole that belongs to that cell only. That was a bit confusing because of the different shapes of all the unit cells. Yeah. So what we would do is that's how much belongs to that cell. Okay, okay. I see. Okay. Uh, Okay, so now we know um, how many moles are represented by that cell. Then we can convert moles to grams. Right. And that value, let's see, I haven't, gone off, I haven't gone off the board yet. So that's 2, and then divided by 1.727 that's what I get. 1.727 7 minus 10 to the minus 22 grams. Now we've got mass and we've got volume. Dr. Blood? Yep. There no reason to hear the word cell. Is that, is that oh, yeah, grams per cell. But this is also cubic centimeters per cell. Right. The cells cancel. Right. That's a good observation. So we'll just leave the cell out in this calculation because it's going away anyway. So the mass then is 1.727 times 10 to the minus 2 grams. And then get rid of 2.40563 times 10 to the minus 23rd. Centimeters. Okay, did you get the same thing I did? Seven point seven seven grams per centimeter. And let's see, we've got uh, three significant figures here, and we kept four there, but this is the limit. So we'll round it off to 7.18 grams per B. Is that it? B? Yeah. All right. Are we good? Pause until the recorders catch up. Okay, I need to do something here.
This is pin video. There we go. Join us. Oh, good. I'll start erasing from this side. By the time I get finished, you should have it done. Okay, let me recenter my. Oh, that's there. I just don't see my periodic table. That's okay. Okay, did we have another one in the difficult section? I was going to release three. Three? Yeah, where it does the percent. Three. Ah, okay. Check 10, difficult three. All right, let's see what we're dealing with here. Uh, metal crystallizes in a body-centered unit cell. Okay, so we've got another body-centered cubic unit cell. Yep, answer the question. No. This one says body-centered cell, and that, like the report says simple cubic bodies. Is there a difference? Body-centered cubic glass. No. Okay. They're synonymous. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, this one has an edge length of, so our edge length is 2.00 times 10. Yeah. Assume the atoms in the cell touch along the Q. Okay. Well, actually, if we say it's body centered cubic unit cell, they have to touch. I mean, that's, that's the premise for body centered cubic. Um, the percentage of empty volume in the unit cell. Okay, so that's the question. Percentage empty volume. All right. Okay. Let's draw a picture. Draw another cubic picture. Try to do this one better than before. There's our unit cell. And we're going to have a, a one in the center. Let's see if I can scale it properly. And I do it. Not big enough, actually. Let's draw these first. How about that? Our diagonal is from this lower left hand corner up through that one in the center and then up to the back up corner. You see that? We're going from the lower left hand corner down here and back or up to this corner. That's the diagonal. It's like they touch. They touch here and here. There, there. Okay? So the edge length along here is the this distance. Picometers. Okay. What's a picometer? Right. Ten to the minus twelve meters is a picometer. Okay. We might need that. We might not. Now, <clears throat> what are we looking for? Well, we're looking for the percent volume that's empty that is not occupied by atoms. So what we have to do is find out. What's the volume of the cube? Right, that's easy. It's this one cubed. Right? And then, what's the volume occupied by the atoms? Previously, two atoms per cell. 
Uh, possibly. What we need is this distance right here, the radius of the atom, because we're not told we're not told what it is. We're just told the size of the cell. So if we know the radius of the atom, and then we can use your two atoms per cell. We know the radius of the atom, then we know we can calculate the volume occupied by the atoms. Right. So what's the radius? What is that anyway? Matter or your elements inside. No, what just what does this circle represent? What geometric shape? Sure. A sphere. A sphere. Right. A sphere. So what's the volume of a sphere? One. Four thirds power cubed. Isn't, it? isn't that the, the volume of a sphere? I think it is. Okay. So what's the radius related to this? That's cubed us, the radius cubed. Right, it's a body center cube. That's right, we had it before. It was uh, 4 r divided by the square root of 3, right? That's the, the edge length. Re related to the radius, the edge length is this. So we're saying that this value, um, let's see, let's leave it at picometers, right? Because we're looking for percent. Right, so cubic picometers, cubic centimeters, it doesn't matter. They're going to be the same value, right? Remember, percent is a dimensionless number. All the dimensions have canceled out. The only thing percent means is parts per hundred. So whatever parts it is. Okay, so <clears throat> the this value. Picometers is equal to four times that radius divided by the square root of three. Right. So R then is going to be uh, square root of three times this divided by four. Right. I'm right big enough for the for the video. That one times this one, okay, divided by that one, right? Let's do calculation and see if we agree. Uh, cube root of three, and then I get. 86.6025 picometers. So that many picometers is R. Okay. Now, this is the volume of one atom. One sphere, one atom. So if we take this as our radius, plug it in here, we can find the volume of one atom, right? But the volume of two atoms is equal to two times that, right? Yeah. And then our R value is eighty-six point six zero two five. Exactly right. right. We need to know the volume of the atoms first. Okay, so that's uh, let's see, where's my pi? There's pi. 
and then I want to multiply that times four times two is eight, divided by three, and then I want to cube this. Eight six four six seven two five. Uh, That's what I got. Did you get that? 5.4414 times 10 to the 6th. Did he get 10 to the 6th? But he gave me 10 to the 3rd. But he gave me 5.44. Okay. Let me see what I did wrong. 86.6022. Oh, that's the wrong one. Yeah, that's the wrong one. Here. Okay, so this I got this point four nine five times ten. I got what you got. You did? Yeah. And then times pi. So I enter pi times that. Then times eight and divided by three. Yeah, I keep getting the same number. I think you can drink it with your throat so sore. Okay. Mute. We'll mute him. Okay, so this is the volume of the atoms. Right? But how did you monitor it? Like, huh? I mean, like, next one. Start to make some pie lines. That might, that might be fine. Yeah. Cube, work backwards. Cube this first. Then multiply that. Then times that, times that, divided by that. Now we've got the volume of the atoms. What else do we need? We're going to have percent empty space. Percent <coughs> empty space. Where am I going with this? I need the volume of the cube. Minus the volume of atoms, atoms in the cube, divided by the volume of the cube. Because if we take away the volume of the atoms from the volume of the cube, what we're left with is empty space, right? So this is the empty space, and then times. Okay, so we've got the volume of the atoms here. Now we need the volume of the cube. So what's the volume of the cube? This is the edge length, right? Right, <laughs> volume of a cube, just cube the edge length. Right. So that would be, um, 8 times 10 is a 6, is it? Let me see if I did that right when I hit it. Yeah, 8 times 10 is a 6. Okay, so to complete this, let's see, let's go over here. So percent empty space. The volume of the cube, so I didn't write it down, 8 times 10 to the 6 cubic picometers. Minus 5.44 
5.4414 times 10 to the sixth. And this is cubic meters. Then divided by the total. Times 100. Okay, right. So these cancel, right? That's why it's a dimensionless number. So these cancel. But it does give us a percentage value. So 8 minus, let's see if I still, yeah, I still got it in there. Let's minus that. And, yeah, that works. So I got 2.5586 times 10 to the 6 divided by 8. I got thirty. I also. Let's see. Um, we got three significant figures, so it's actually thirty-two point zero percent in this place. Okay. Which one is that? Let's see. All right. Everybody follow? Or does it sound like a, one of those Charlie Brown cartoons? You know what I'm talking about? Wah, wah, wah. <laughs> it should make sense. It's just that you have to take it a piece at a time. You need some either controlling formula, controlling principle, something to anchor your logic or your calculations. And you go to the question for that one. The question is percent empty space. Then you define what your empty space is. I should have done that first. How do you calculate percent empty space? Well, you need the volume of the cube, and then you need the volume of the atoms to subtract, subtract, because that leaves empty space. Then you go to how do you find each one of these? So the volume of the cube is easy, right? That's why I left it the last. The volume of the atoms takes a little more work. Say so how many atoms are there there? How do you find the volume of a sphere? Right? And you got two of them. We had to find the, in order to fill in this value, radius, we had to find out what's the radius of atoms based on the edge length of the cube. Okay, so it's step by step. So you have to be very methodical. For the percent of space, you usually know that. Mm -hmm. Yep. So this is given. All right, there's your question. Then you go to, well, actually, this that's the question. This is how you calculate the answer to the question. Then you need to go find out each one of these. Volume of the cube is easy. You've got that um, here. Volume of the cube. Okay. Then you have to find the volume of the atom. To do that, you need edge length right here. I mean the uh, edge length converted to radius. So you need that formula. Once you have this one, you can find out uh, the volume of the atoms. Kind of convoluted, isn't it? <clears throat> then once you've got these two volumes, then they can go into the percent empty space that you've got over here. Step by step. But it does help to draw a picture. Okay, anything else? Let's see. Did the problems using the Bragg equation give anybody trouble? Is that the uh, um, in lambda? 
opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. Right. N times lambda equals um, <clears throat> 2D, which is the separation of layers, distance between the layers, then the sine of the uh, angle, the angle of, uh, actually it's not, it's not calculated the same way as angle of incidence, not the same way you would do in optics. Right? The angle of incidence in optics is, what's the angle with the vertical? Angle Angle of incline is what this is based on. Yes. <clears throat> Run out of time. I'm going to look at chapter 11 eventually. But I think more of the difficult stuff is in chapter 10. Chapter 11 is. Pretty straightforward. The only one I had to do with was like the pressure, take with pressure. Ah. <laughs> that makes sense. Anybody else on chapter 10? Could we, we look at the phase diagram in the moderate, like number 26? Mm, okay. Okay. Let's see, I got back up one more page. Here we go. 25? 26, or any of the phase one, any of the phase diagrams. Okay. So let's see. We're stepping back to moderate here. Oh, actually, it's an easy. Oh. Is it? Yeah, I got mixed up. An easy section? <laughs> And you're right. So easy section, and we'll look at 26. That's fine. Okay. So we've got a phase diagram here for a compound Q. Really doesn't matter. You want to purify a sample Q that was collected at. Okay, so Q. Was collected at a pressure of one atmosphere and a temperature of 100 K by sublimation. Ah, so we're going to use the phase diagram to uh, define the conditions for sublimation. Right. So I think I need to sketch this one out. Right, so this is pressure in atmospheres. This is temperature in Kelvin. And we have one, two, three. Okay. And we have half, one, one and a half. Okay, now the diagram ends up over here, right, right here. And then it shoots off here, and there, and there. Right. And we got another one that goes out to almost 300, actually right at 300. The same slope. There and then goes up a little bit like that. Okay. So first of all, <clears throat> let's identify the sections of this phase diagram. Okay. What's this section? Solid. Right. Low temperature, high pressure. Solid. What about this one? Look at this. Like, well, like gas is down here. Oh, okay. Right. Low pressure, high temperature, gas. Okay. Now, we're going to sublime 
at one atmosphere at 100 K. By sublimating it at one atmosphere and 100 K. So there's our solid. All right. How are we going to get that to sublime? What do we mean by sublime? Um, it's not by turning a solid to. Other way around. Oh, no, that's right. Um, right solid to a gas. Solid to a gas. Yes. You're right. So if we do it right here, but if we just hold that pressure at one atmosphere and go increase temperature, we're going to end up with a liquid. We're not going to end up with a gas. Why would we want to sublime a solid? Right? If we're going to purify it, we want to leave everything else behind. Right? And if you sublime it, then everything else that's in that sample with this Q will turn to a gas and it's left behind to stay solid. Right, everything else will just stay solid and the Q will leave as a gas. Then when we get the gas, we just cool it down and uh, Let's see, what's the opposite of sublime? Deposit. We we'll deposit the gas. Deposition. So this should be around the gas solid. Right. Once you get it separated, then you can resubline. But this this step is just turning from solid to gas. We can't do it from here. Right? Because if we just increase the temperature, we'll go through liquid. But if we um, if we hold the temperature at 100 and decrease the pressure, then we can go from solid to gas. Right? We can't go this direction. We can go this direction. So let's see if one of these selections uh, is valid for that approach. Increase the pressure to one and a half atmospheres, and then increase temperature uh, to 300. That won't do it. Go see liquid again, right? So A's out. B, increase temperature to 300 K, keeping pressure at one. Now we still go through the liquid. Can't do that. The reason being, if you do either one of those, then by converting them to liquids, you may also vaporize other components that are in the sample. You don't want to do that. How about C? Lower the pressure to a half, okay, come down to here, and then increase temperature to 200. Down here, here, that's it. C. That will sublime the sample. <laughs> or E, throw up your hands. Just give up. <laughs> no, we don't do that. But it turns the gap on its own. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just, just wait a couple million years and you'll have your sample. Okay. Where do we do this type of stuff? This is actually a practical approach to separating components. So is it D? Huh? So is it D? Was it D? D. C. C. We do this. We freeze dry samples. Decrease the pressure. You push your sample. You freeze your sample. Put it in a chamber. Decrease the pressure. And then add just a little bit of heat. Doesn't take much. And you. In those applications, most of the time, you just want to get rid of water. You dry. There's a other, there's a fancy name for this. It's called. I'm sorry. You lyophilize your sample. They mean the same thing. Okay, but you're using the physical process of sublimation to remove water from your sample. 
Now, in this case, we don't know what Q is. It's probably not water. How do I know that? Because of this one right here. On the phase diagram of water, it goes the other direction. Okay? That's how you know it's not water. We don't know what it is, but we know it's not water. <clears throat> okay, any questions? All right. We want to do another phase? Why not? <laughs> Let's see. Well, if we went to 27, this is really just a simple, really simple question. Okay. So if we have this phase diagram, temperature, in this case it's degree C, which is okay. Pressure and atmospheres. Then we have this is minus 50, this is 10, and this is 70. That's not to, uh, that's not to scale, is it? Negative 50. 60. Oh, yeah, it is, because negative 50 to, to 10 is 60 units, 10 to 76. Okay, so that's okay. And then we have, uh, it says zero atmospheres, this is a half, and this is one, okay? Now, we're starting at about here, and we're going up to 10 and 0.5 meet, and we're going on up to where one and 70 meet, there. This supposed to be a straight line, and then at this point we have that. Okay, those other lines are just parallels to show where these things meet. So this one, let me make them dotted lines. That one meets there, there. So those are directors, they're not part of the phase diagram itself. Okay. That could be confusing. All right, then the question is, at which of the following values of temperature pressure is the substance of pure liquid? So that's, we have to identify the parts of the chart, right? Where's the solid? Here. Where's the liquid? Here. And the gas? There. Okay, now pure liquid. So it's got to be somewhere in here. Or pure liquid. So I can see. Probably. Temperature eight degrees of the year and one atmosphere. There. So this is A. B is ten degrees and half an atmosphere. What is that? Right on top. What is that? That's got a special name. The triple point. Right. What do we mean by triple point? It, it can be in the middle point all three. All phases at the same time. Yes. Solid, liquid, gas, all at the same time, only at this pressure and that temperature. So would that be like kind of like we're going to use ice. So like solid ammonia, liquid ammonia, gaseous ammonia in the container at the same time. So like you have gas, well, so like if you have a piece of ice, it's in a container, but then you start having like a little bit of water, uh -huh. it's leaking, uh -huh. and then you also have vapor in it too. 
Yep. So for D, I mean, it's on the line, we'd be in gas and liquids. So oh, we haven't seen, we haven't done the scene yet. I mean, D. I kind of, I'm just going there because I'm on the line as well. Oh, 80 degrees, 80 degrees would be about right here. And one atmosphere would be. Oh, I thought it would be on the line. Uh, no. It would be, D would be a gas. And then we skip to C, which was 70 and 1.2. 70 and 1.2 be right in here. So that would be the pure liquid. And E, we're going to do E. 10 and 1. 10 and 1. That's a solid. Okay. So E, uh, C is the only one that works. Okay, let's see, what else do we need to do? Twenty-nine seems a little kind of it's kind of a strange question. Let's see if we can extract information from the twenty-nine. Okay, so here's our <coughs> Phase diagram, pressure and atmospheres, and this is one atmosphere. Temperature down here, so it's not giving us a whole lot of information. So it looks like the triple point is just under one, right about here. So from here to here. And then from here to here, and then from here, that's not the shallow right. So we have, I'm not sure what that means. I have to look at the question. Okay. Given the phase diagram below, which of the following statements, A through D, is false? The solid has a higher density than the liquid. How do we know? Just because it's branching out way too many water. Right. This this is the solid, right? This is the liquid. This is the gas. Right? So we're looking at um, the density based on uh, this line. The phase line between solid and liquid. So if the temperature drops, as the temperature drops, the pressure required to maintain the solid increases. So go this way, that way. Or as the pressure decreases, the temperature would have to increase. So the slope is negative. on this line that we're interested in. <clears throat> um, to answer this question, now it doesn't say that this is water, right? but water is an example of this type of uh, so slope, phase difference between solid and liquid. And we know that for water, The density of the um, solid is less than the density of the liquid. So that's why we're saying that A is false, just by comparison to water. At some constant temperature, okay, constant temperature. The gaseous substance can be compressed into a solid. That's true. Say if we're over here, 
increase the pressure, a gas can be made into a solid. That's true. When phase A is compressed at constant temperature at point X, okay, so this is phase A, A phase, and this is X point. So, say right there. When phase A is compressed at constant temperature, no change is observed. All right, here's what we're saying in this case. No, what we're saying is this is the end of the phase difference between liquid and gas. This is the supercritical region out here. So whenever you compress a gas, under these conditions, you can't tell the difference between gas and liquid. They're both, I mean, it's, they're indistinguishable from one another. Because right. this is the supercritical region. So when you compress it, this is true. No change is observed. You can't tell the difference. When heated at one atmosphere, okay, one atmosphere, this substance will first melt, then boil. Yep. Melt, then boil. Okay. Probably water. None of the above is false. Well, that was false. <clears throat> okay, so the only one that's that's uh The only one that's false is A. Rest of truth. Okay. Anything else in chapter 10 or we want to go to chapter 11? We can stay in 10 if you want. If you got a, a, a burning issue. I think it's number one. Good, okay. All right. So let's make a change here. There we go. Let's see what was giving anybody trouble. First one is uh, number one is just trying to determine if you know the difference between mole fraction, mass fraction, mass percent, molality. Because you have to calculate each one to answer the question. I just did that. You just did it? Okay. Do we need to do that one? You can go over it. Okay. Let's say one. And this is easy one. Okay, in a 0 0.1 molar solution, so we're given 0 0.1 molar of uh, sodium chloride. Which of the following would be closest to 0.1? So of these others, uh, mole fraction, mole fraction of sodium chloride. Will it be close to 0.1? Right. So, this is where we start. And these are basically, uh, well, let me change that too. Molarity is moles per liter. Right. And we're going to change it to mole fraction. So, what do we need to know? Uh, 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 sodium chloride is like uh, How many moles of sodium chloride is that? Okay. 
let's see. Can we take the mass, smaller mass? Hold on a second. If this is moles of sodium chloride, we want to know uh, actually we've got the moles of sodium chloride right here. Right? We don't need to change that. What we need to know is how many moles of solution does that represent? Okay. So what's the density? of water. Well, to answer the question that's asked, which is closest to point one, we can assume that the density of uh, this solution is uh, one gram per mil. Right. And actually, it's 0.997. But let's see if it works with one. Okay. So this is one gram per milliliter, but that's not milliliters. So we need to convert liters to milliliters. Now we can so that one and that one. And um, this gives us but it doesn't give us the final answer. What we need is um, let's just keep going. This gives us grams of water actually. Right? Because this concentration is low enough we can we can say that is the uh, the grams. Hold on a second. Most times we need grams of solution. All right, so we are going to say that the solution is essentially water, right? That's one of the assumptions that you have to make. So we've got um, 18.02 grams or mold. Is that sodium? What's that sodium chloride by? Perfect. Oh, it's an H2O. Right. 16 plus 2.02. .02. Now, that should give us mole fraction because this will be uh, moles of sodium chloride per moles of water, which we are saying is essentially moles of solution. Okay. That's one of the trickiest things about chemistry is where do you make assumptions? Usually, you make assumptions when you're stuck. <laughs> you can't move unless you make an assumption. Right? So that's where we were here. Plug something in. Huh? Plug something in, even if you don't know what you're talking about. Well, you try to get as close to the truth yeah. as possible. So we reason that most of this solution is water. So we'll say moles of the solution is basically equivalent to moles of water. Right. So we've got 0.1 and then 1,000 divided and then times 18.02 and we get 1.8 times 10 to the minus third um, moles of sodium chloride per mole we're saying a mole solution. Right. So that's nowhere near 0.1 molar. Right. So that means A is false. That doesn't work. How about B? What's B? Um, mass. mass fraction. So percent by mass. Percent sodium chloride mass mass. Well, it says mass fraction. Okay, so um, mass fraction just means you leave out the times a hundred part. So 
still charge per cell. All right, so, um, right, one, oh, sodium chloride, per liter. And what we need is the number of moles of solution. Not actually, not the number of the mass of the solution. That's what we need. And we need the mass of sodium chloride. All right. So we're going to do one at a time. Remember, when we're doing unit conversions, we do one at a time. So how many grams of sodium chloride does that represent? Well, we need grams. That's the molar mass of sodium chloride. Okay. So this gets rid of moles of sodium chloride and leaves us with grams of sodium chloride. Okay. That's in the numerator. So grams of sodium chloride, and now we convert the denominator. So liters of solution, and we need um, grams of solution, right? So if this is liters, and we convert liters to uh, milliliters, and then milliliters to uh, grams, all right. So if you have milliliters of solution in a dilute aqueous solution, a milliliter is a gram. One gram per milliliter. So this is milliliters gram point one. Okay. You didn't see that jump? No, I didn't. <laughs> but you said so milliliter of water just counts as one gram. Yeah. Who, uh, you can roughly estimate that uh, the specific gravity of water is one. I cited the point nine 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 seven, but it's one to one. So one milliliter of water. We're making this assumption again. Right? This solution is aqueous and it's dilute. So we're saying that one milliliter of this solution is one gram of solution. Are we assuming it's dilute? Yeah, point one molar. We don't have any choice, really. Unless you're given, am I missing something? Were we given the density of the solution? No, we weren't. So we have to assume. In the work problems, I'm giving you the density of 0 0.997. All right. But this should work, because all we want to do is find out which one's closest to that one, right. with the new units of measure. So if we have 0 0.1 times, uh, so that's 5.844, right, these two, and then divided by 1,000, we've got 5.844 times 10 to the minus third uh, mass fraction. If we want a percent, we just multiply by 100. So multiply that by 100, what do you get? 0.58 mass percent. So that was nowhere near. What's next? Mass percent. Oh, okay. So, so mass percent, yeah, we just take that one. Times by 100. That must be the answer. The molality of sodium chloride. So how do we do molality? Molality, let's see, we're starting off with molar. We want molality, so that's little m. Okay. We have 
zero point one mole per liter. So what are the units of molality? Moles on the top, right? What's on the bottom? Isn't that like one thousand kilograms? Moles per kilogram. So if the density of water and the uh, solution we assume is basically aqueous water, the density is one to one, then how many grams in a liter? Thousand grams. Thousand grams is a kilogram. Right? So we're saying that that's equal to point one. Well, wow. Roughly. Not exactly. Right? Depends on the temperature. It depends on the, the true density. This one is the closest one. So 0 0.1 mole is 0 0.1 mole out for aqueous solutions. Of course, <clears throat> if we're not talking about aqueous solutions, I mean, other types of solutions, then all bets are off. It depends on the density. Right. So if you've got something that's a different density than water, then you have to include a calculation for density here to find out what molality is. And that would be the case for us today. Right. Because lauric acid, liquid lauric acid, is less dense than water. Right. So we couldn't use that relationship in today's lab. Okay, well there was an E, wasn't there? All of these are about point 0.1. No, E is false. This is the only one. D is the only one that meets those conditions. Yeah. All right. What's next? We're doing pretty good on time. Yeah, another hour if we need it. Would the chapter 11 have moderate and difficult in it too? Yes. Well, let's see if we need to leave the, the easy section first. And if we do, we'll move on to something more difficult. Um, let's just take five for giggles. So which of the following favors the solubility of an ionic solid in a liquid solid? Ionic solid is the solute. And we're going to put it in a solution with uh, a liquid solid. But we're not told the characteristics of the solid. That's part of the uh, A through E answers. So which one of these would favor a solution or increase solubility of that ionic solute in our solid? Let's see, a uh, large let's see, a large magnitude of the solvation energy of the ions. Solvation energy. Or B, a small lattice energy. Okay. 
this salvation, I think we need to clarify, this salvation energy is provided by what? This salvation energy is provided by, it's provided by the solvent, yes. That salvation energy is provided by the solvent. A large polarity. Large polarity of the salt. Okay. Uh, D is all and D is none. Okay. So let's see what that means. Number five. No, I don't even explain it. <laughs> I just give you a reference to uh, to the textbook. Okay, so what favors solvation of the of the solute? If the solvent can provide large solvation energy, what does that mean? That's right. That's the energy that the solvent uh, uses to pull the ions apart. Well, remember the three steps, or the three stages in solvation, right? The uh, solute um, dissociation. In other words, you've got to pull the solvent apart. And then solvent dissociation, which is uh, make a hole, right? You got to add energy to pull the the solvent molecules apart. You got to add energy to pull the solute apart. Then return energy. Uh, um, solute solvent interaction. So once you've got this pulled apart and this pulled apart, then individually, then they come back together and associate. So the more energy you get back here, the better. Okay? So let's go back to this one. What, what's happening here? Large solvation energy. That is, uh, that's the amount of energy that's being provided to tear your solute apart. Small lattice energy. Well, if a large energy is being provided by the solvent and the lattice energy is very low, then there should be plenty of energy from the solvent to rip the solute apart. So these combinations, these two combined, gives you a net uh, solute dissociation. It's easy to do that. Then the, what does the large polarity of the solvent mean? That means that if this ionic solute, once it's pulled apart into its ions, it's going to be attracted to polar molecules. Large attraction, polar molecules. So if you have a large polarity of the solvent, these individual ions that have been pulled apart will be attracted to the solvent and you get a lot of energy back. So all three of these favor solution. All right. Now let's see. Oh, we're still in the easy section. This one. Did I explain that one? I hope I did. I don't know if I explained it very well. That's not a good, the number six is not a good explanation. So, 
Let me see if I've got one like that in the exam. I should have seen that in an earlier semester. Done away with it. Or put it in bonus. Okay, something like that's in bonus, so maybe I better talk about it. I have trouble with six. I'll be surprised if it didn't. So, solid potassium fluoride has a lattice energy. Let's see, how am I going to abbreviate that? Let's see, delta H lattice is minus 804 kilojoules per mole. Okay. Uh, and the heat of solution let's see, let me put it out here. And the heat of solution equals Minus 15 kilojoules. We'll define our terms in a minute. And this is in water. No, no that's not right. But per mole of water. Per mole. Heat of solution. Water. Everything. And this, uh, and the other is rubidium fluoride as a lattice energy of negative 768 kilojoules per mole. And the heat of solution in water. Of minus 24. Okay. So the question is which forms a stronger attraction with water? Between uh, those two and the cat. Uh, right. Between the KF and the rubidium chloride. Stronger attraction to. Water. That's the question. Or are they equal? That's one of the options. Um, all right. So uh, let's go back to that uh, three step process. And in terms of a a formula, the uh, heat of solution is equal to these three Let's see, I'm still on yeah, still on the board right this is the one where you break the side you apart, this is the one where you break the Solving part, and this is the one where you get um, the solvation. That's the word. The solvation where the solute and the solvent interact. So this is input, input, return. Okay, so this one should be negative, negative. This one could be negative, uh, zero, or positive. So negative, negative, and negative, or positive. And, and variable. Could be any one. All right. So what do they mean in terms of the information that we're given? Well, the first.
first one is a measure of the lattice energy. Right? So that's the amount of energy it takes to break that uh, solid apart, the solute. Right? So that's your lattice energy. The this part is um, what's known as solid expansion. That's the fancy word for make a hole. And then this part is the is well organized solvation. Okay. Um, so what do we have in terms of our values? Well, the expression here the uh, delta H, the solvent expansion this is the same for both of them, right? This is the same for both. Right. Same for both what? This is the same for both of those, of those because they're both going into water. Right. So that's not the difference. The difference here is due to the heat of solvation. And the heat of solvation is the uh, attraction of water. The heat of solution then is um, we can actually drop this term out because it's the same. So it's not like we're we're actually throwing it out. I mean the same yeah go ahead. When you started with um, changing the uh, solvation, I thought it was the same book as well. No, the heat of solvation, that, that won't be the same because you have different ions here, potassium and rubidium. So, and this, this is the heat of solution, which is uh, the heat of solution is a measure of these two. Heat of solution. Here's the heat of solution. Okay. So this is the heat of solution is equal to this one plus that one. And the uh, let's see. Yeah, that's right. So what's the heat of solution for KF? Negative solution negative is equal to negative 15 millijoules per mole. Okay. And that's equal to um, that wind up with a negative. Lattice energy is the amount of energy. So this is the lattice energy. So that's supposed to be negative for negative expansive. No. Yeah. That's why this is not a good question. So because if I if I put a negative here, it's too yeah, why did I put it? Why did I put a negative here? Oh, I know. I know. Okay. It based on the definition of lattice energy. Um 
Lattice energy is the amount of energy that you get back when um, the gaseous elements come together. It's the way it's measured. And in, in the way we're using it here, it's the amount of energy you put in. So if you get back that certain amount of energy, then we need to change the sign. So this, this uh, delta H for the solute is actually the negative of the delta H of the lattice. That's the tricky part. Say that again. Right. Since the lattice energy measures how much energy you get back when the gaseous elements form a crystal lattice, and the uh, delta H for the solute is how much energy you put in to break them apart. Then you need a negative sign here to make use of those values. So it's good to we can go out, you to say? Well, it will make the negative positive. So if we have a negative here for KF, then that's minus 804 kilojoules per mole. And then this value is the uh, this is the delta H of hydration, these two together. So if we say uh, plus delta H of hydration, then we have an expression, and this will tell us answer that question. What's the attraction to water? Right, so if we say solve for this one, then this is positive, but it becomes a negative over here, and we have a negative 804, right, and a 15. So this is uh, 819. Okay. So this one is for KF. How about for RBF? If we substitute values in here for RBF, minus 24 here, um, minus 24. And then we do the same thing with 768, which makes it negative 768. Add them together, what do you get? 792 minus 792. Okay. Now, which one has a stronger affinity for water? The more negative one, because that's the one that gives you more energy back. So KF. Right. So KF has the stronger affinity for water. That's the kind of question that was dedicated to uh, confused chemistry majors. And since None of us are chemistry majors. I can see where it would confuse. But that's not going to be in a required section. If you see anything like that, it'll be in a bonus. so easy after all. I don't know why that was in the easy section. Easy <laughs> okay. How about seven? We're going to use this little diagram which has a um, a gaseous solute in equilibrium with a solution. All right, so we have this container, and it has a piston. Here. 
and then we can apply force to the piston. So we can increase the pressure on it. So there's a solution in here, right? Okay. And this is the liquid. This is the gas. And then these gas molecules, some of them are dissolved in the liquid. Okay? Set up for the problem. At this point, they're in equilibrium because we haven't applied any force to it. Everything's stable. Certain concentration here, certain amount of gas up there. Then the question is, which of the following statements is true? Uh, if we apply force, if we apply force on that, then what happens? A says this will cause the pressure of the gas to decrease, to increase in the concentration of the dissolved gas to go down. Okay, there's two step, two parts to that statement. This will cause the pressure of the gas to increase. Is that true? So the pressure of the gas increase. Is that true? Yeah, that's true, right? Because you're decreasing the volume, pressure has to go up. But will it also cause the concentration of the dissolved gas, concentration of the gas, to go up? Uh, to go down, excuse me, go down. Will the concentration in here go up or down when you increase the pressure? Right. So that's wrong. Right. The concentration will not go down. Concentration will go up. Um, this will cause the pressure to the gas to decrease. Well, that was false. We only have to laugh to look at the second half. C. The pressure of the gas will increase. Okay. We already established that one. And the concentration of the gas will go up. Can you explain why it would go up? Let's see, what is it? Uh, Henry's Law? Yeah. Right. As you increase the pressure of the gas over liquid, the concentration dissolved in the, of the gas dissolved in the liquid goes up. Right. So we can stop there. Since there are no two of these, none of these, all of these, and we're done. See the answer. the relationship of pressure to gas dissolved in a liquid. Number eight is the relationship of temperature. How is it proportional to concentration of gas in solution? That's the question. Okay. Well, maybe the quickest way to answer this is what do we know about the solubility of gases in liquids? What's the most common as the temperature goes up? Concentration goes down. Right. For most, right. but not all. <clears throat> Some other way around. The solubility of substance in what actually. <clears throat> the solvent is water. The solubility of a substance in water increases as the temperature rises, especially for gases. Well, that's false. You know, that flies in the face of this. 
Solubility of substance in water decreases as the temperature rises, especially for ionic solids. Oh, oh, oh. You guys didn't even catch me on this. We're not talking just about gases. We're talking about gases, liquids, or solids. Right? So we know that one goes one direction, one goes the other direction, usually. But the solubility of the substance in water decreases as the temperature rises. Well, that's false. Most of the time it goes up. Um, all right. Here's the one that is the most true, right? It's either true or false, but this is the most true. You can't tell. There's no way to tell what the solubility in water uh, of a substance will be, especially ionic substances, as the temperature changes. You can't predict it. Yeah. It could go up, could go down. And for ionic solids, some of them go up, some of them go down as the temperature changes. Right. So the best answer for that one, and as always, you know, this may not be the correct answer, but it's the best one that you have available. The best answer is uh, C. Cannot be accurately, accurately predicted. Okay, any more of the easy ones? How about this one? I'm surprised that, that so many of uh, my students don't get this one right. Okay, we're going to cut a piece of cucumber and put it in concentrated salt solution. Aqueous salt. Okay. What's most likely going to happen? Water will flow from the cucumber to the solution. Or B, water will flow from the solution to the cucumber. Or C, salt will flow into the cucumber. Or D, salt will precipitate out. Let's see. Is the salt going to move? No. What's what's key to this whole operation? Right. Semi permeable. Permeable. Permeable membrane. Anytime you put a cell in water, you're talking about a semi permeable membrane. What passes through a semi-permeable membrane? Water. Passively, just water and gases. Not salts or large molecules. They won't go through. Right? So you can eliminate C and D right off the bat. Salt's not going to move. So it's either A or B. Which way is the water going to move? Right? Draw a picture. So there's your solution. And there's your slice of cucumber for the seeds. So which way is water going to move if this is concentrated by sodium chloride? It doesn't matter, but we're just going to pick sodium chloride. Concentrated sodium chloride. Which way is the water going to move? Which In which one is the salt concentration higher, here or here? The solution. Right. That's the high one. So the water is going to move into the solution. Since A. Um, yeah, A. What is the osmotic pressure dependent on? How do we write osmotic pressure? Pi. 
Osmotic pressure depends upon what? Temperature? Pressure? Well, let's just write them all down. Pressure, molality, temperature, uh, ratio, uh, ratio of moles solute to solution volume or none of these. Think about that diagram where we were saying, all right, osmotic pressure, if we have this, uh, I think it was a two then we had this like that with our membrane here. And this was the concentrated uh, solution, and this was pure water. Right. They start off at the same level. Okay. Oops, wrong way. Excuse me. Should have copied them out. This is water, and this is the concentrated solution. There we go. Now, we just determined that the water is going to move across the membrane into the concentrated solution. Right? So what's going to happen to the level here? It's going to go up, 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 up. When does it stop? It doesn't stop when they're the same concentration, right? Because this is water. It'll never be the right concentration, right? Because there's nothing moving back this way, right? So what's keeping it from going out the top and just squirting? Atmospheric pressure, right? So you've got pressure bearing down here and here, right? So, so they're actually, the pressure's equal on both sides, mm -hmm. so the only difference is the height of that column, right? So if you've got pressure bearing down on it, the only thing holding it up is, uh, is the difference between that level and this level of pressure. So theoretically, this pressure, um, let's see, what's this? Those pressure one, pressure two. They won't be the same, right? You know that because when you when you go up a mountain, your ears pop. But on this limited scale, it's still true. The pressure here, I said it was the same, but it's not really. So the pressure here is higher than the pressure here. And the difference in pressure. is the balancing force that balances the movement backwards and forwards across that membrane. So once the, the difference is established at this delta P, it balances the movement of water there, and this is equal to the osmotic pressure, that difference. We measure it as the height of that column, but then we have to convert it to what is that equal to in terms of pressure in atmospheres. Okay? So that's really the only dependence is atmospheric pressure. Well, it says all but which of the following. Yeah, you're right. Molarity of the solution, that has a bearing. Temperature has a bearing. Right? We didn't talk about that very much. But temperature does influence osmotic pressure. Ratio of moles of solute to moles of solution is another way of saying concentration. Right. So, all right. Why then is atmospheric pressure not uh, dependent? Why is it not dependent on atmospheric pressure? What 
if we try that same experiment, say, uh, well, Mars, that atmospheric pressure is too low. Then we have a, a planet, an imaginary planet that has an atmospheric pressure of exactly half of ours at sea level. What's the difference between here and here? The only difference is that column. It doesn't matter what this is and that is, the difference is still the same. Right. So that's why atmospheric pressure doesn't matter. You should be able to measure the, the osmotic pressure of this solution in Denver just as easily as Beckley, just as easily as Miami. Okay. Pressure doesn't matter. It's the difference in pressure that matters. Okay, I'd go around the barn three or four times to get that one done. How are we doing on time? Okay, we've got about a half hour left. Anything in the moderates? Let's see, let me check something. Make sure the formula is there. Osmotic pressure. Where is it? I don't see it. Probably looking straight at it. There's rag. Body center cube. Mole fraction. I don't see osmotic pressure in here. Okay. Well, if you need it during the test, actually remind me and I'll put it on the board before the test starts. So, we're still easy here. Um, oh, I was giving out on me. <clears throat> did we get a Jupiter? Yeah. Did we? Yeah, yeah. So we just did Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't make reference to, uh, in 13, I didn't make reference to the uh, formula. There we go. So it does depend on the concentration and the temperature, but it says nothing about pressure. That's another way to approach it. The formula for osmotic pressure. Uh, as a factor for concentration and a factor for uh, polarity, I mean temperature, but not for anything else. So what, the gas constant, which gas constant would we use here? Uh, 0 0.8, no, uh, 0 0.02. Is that it? That's the most Yes. <laughs> liter atmospheres per mole. Okay, so uh, moles per liter. Right, there's your concentration. K is your temperature. Atmosphere is your pressure. And the atmosphere then becomes part of that. The rest of it cancel out. Okay, I'm going to leave that up there just in case we need it. Um, how about, you mentioned vapor pressure gave you trouble. Yeah. Yeah, vapor pressure. Very much. <laughs> so let's look at it. Uh, Moderate 
uh, number four. Okay, which of these solutions would have the highest vapor pressure, lowest boiling point? Does that make sense? A lowered boiling point would be a uh, lower concentration of uh, a solute. Because right? as you increase the amount of solute in your solution, you also increase the boiling point. So let's see, we're looking for um, highest um, vapor pressure and okay they're coming in pairs all right and lowest so we're not going to count them we're counting them independently lowest one So for A, we have 0 0.1 molar calcium chloride and 0 0.1, that's molal, excuse me, molal. Calcium chloride versus 0 0.15 molal glucose and 0 0.1 molal calcium chloride, 0 0.1 molal calcium chloride again, and then 0 0.15 molal glucose. For um, vapor pressure and boiling point, we're talking about both colligative properties. So it really doesn't matter what these things are, except whether or not they dissociate. Right? It's the number of particles. Right? So what's the, the particle? concentration of calcium chloride. You've got two chloride ions and one calcium ion, right? So actually 0 0.3 molal for this one. Yeah, 2 plus 1 is 3. 3 times 0.1 is 0.3 molal. So the concentration of particles in that solution is actually three times that value. Are we okay? So how about this one? Glucose does not dissociate in water. So that concentration is it. This one is 0 0.3. Right? This one is still 0.1. This one is 0 0.3. This one is still 0 0.15, 0 0.15. How about this one? 0 0.2. 1, 2. You get one sodium, one chloride. So its concentration is 0 0.2 for colligative properties, for that purpose. And this one is 0 0.3. All right. Now we've got the true concentrations of particles, and we can look at these questions. 
highest vapor pressure. So what's the highest vapor pressure? It's the one that has the lowest concentration of dissolved non-volatile substance. Right. So for one, which is this column, which one has the lowest concentration? Yes, this one. Right. B and D. So it's either this one or this one. Right. B, D for the first condition. So we just need to look at these two and say lowest boiling point. Lowest boiling point would be the lowest concentration. Because right? the higher the concentration, the higher the boiling point. So it's, yeah, glucose again. Yeah. Or it should be D. Is it D? Yeah. Okay. Talking about colligative properties, you have to know what the true concentration of particulates is. And whether or not it ionizes or dissociates in any way. That's brown, doesn't want to wipe off. Probably easier to see the brown though in the video. Uh, okay. Let's see what else can we tackle here. There is a difficult section. Maybe we ought to just do the first one. Difficult number one. Pressure of water at 25 degrees. So the vapor pressure of water at 25 degrees is equal to 23.8 torr. Remember what a torr is? Um, 7 point, 6, 7, 60, uh, 760 pressure. It's equal to millimeters of mercury. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's the same as millimeters of mercury. So if you want to find atmospheres, you just divide it by 760. That's where you were going, I'm sure. Uh, determine the mass of glucose needed to add to 500 grams of water to change the vapor pressure to 22.84. Okay. If we're looking at this vapor pressure, well, the vapor pressure at any concentration, this is this is the vapor pressure of pure water, so we put a little zero up here. How are they related? Right? The actual vapor pressure is equal to what? This is the pure substance. This is the one with something dissolved in it. The vapor pressure here is equal to the mole fraction of solvent times that pressure. Okay? This is just the fraction of that pure substance that's still left in solution after you dissolve something in it. Right? So it's going to be less than one. But if it's a dilute solution, it'll be really close to one. So to get a major effect, you have to have a pretty high concentration. All right, so what's our target? So this is P0. P then, actual is 22.8. Uh, 22.8. 
that's what we're looking for. And since um, this divided by that equals that, right? put this over here, then the tours are going to cancel, so we don't have to change the atmospheres. Right? We can eliminate that step. Then the question becomes, determine the mass of glucose needed to add 500 grams of water. So the concentration we want is um, mass uh, glucose per 500 grams of water. All right, so let's just keep this one in the back of your mind. We have to find out um, how many moles is that per grams of grams of water, right? Because this is mole fraction. We've got to find out moles of water and then mass so that we don't get confused with molality. Mass of glucose. So, we know what the mole fraction is because all we need is a simple division. Right? The mole fraction of our solid is equal to this one divided by that one. Right? So that's 22.8 or divided by 23.8. That's the mole fraction of our solvent <coughs> of water, <coughs> which is what? Zero point nine five seven nine eight three mole fraction of water. Okay. All right. So if we know that there are only two substances in that solution, what's the mole fraction of glucose? Okay, let's see. Uh, I'll put it in scientific notation. 201, 6, 8, 10 to the minus 2. Glucose. This is the mole fraction. Uh, glucose. Okay? So now that means this mole fraction means what? Moles of glucose. Per mole solution. Right? So we have a problem here. We need to change it to from mole glucose to mass glucose. We can do that. Right? Did the problem give us the molar mass of glucose? Uh, number one. Yeah, 180 grams per mole. Right. So if this is, let me put it way over here, 4.2 of 168 times 10 to the minus 2 mole glucose per mole of solution. Okay. First of all, is that a concentrated or a dilute solution? Um, I say it's dilute. Yeah. Right? Because you've only got let's see, one, two, four hundredths mole glucose per mole solution. That's pretty dilute. The reason I say that is we want to make another assumption. Let's assume that the 
moles of solution are essentially the moles of water. Okay, so this, we can convert this one. First, we're going to convert moles of glucose to mass of glucose. 180, wasn't it? Grams of glucose for one mole. Yep. Okay. So that takes care of moles of glucose. Now we got grams of glucose. Good. Now we need to find out moles of solution to grams of solution or grams of water, actually. So we're going to say this is the same as that. So if we've got um, moles of water, grams of water, okay? How many grams of water in a mole? 18.02. Right? right. Okay. So this will give us grams of glucose per gram of water, but we want 500 grams of water. Per one solution. So per solution of 500 grams of water, then that value is going to be mass of glucose per solution. Right, we just need to do the math. Those two grams cancel out. Yeah. Two Yeah. Um let's see. Three significant figures, two ten? Yes. Zero. Two ten grams of glucose. That one of our answers. It's always good to know. Uh, no. Where's the mistake? Let me see. Maybe I made an assumption that I shouldn't have. Okay, that's right. Mole fraction of solvent is equal to mole of water per. Oh, oh, oh. Okay. I see what I did wrong. Actually, I made it more difficult than it needed to be. So, the mole fraction of um, The mole fraction of water, that's why we didn't even need this either. What is the mole fraction here equal to? 9, 5, 7, 9, 8, 3. So just erase everything we did. <laughs> Sorry. Just, just mark through it. Mole fraction equals moles of water per moles of solution, which is moles of uh, water plus moles of glucose. Okay.
So how many moles of water? Actually, it doesn't matter. Not really. Let me see. Can I say that? No, I can't say that. Hold on a second. Okay, I missed one calculation. In 500 grams of water, how many moles does that represent? That's key. Two here. So that's uh, 27.7. Then we can substitute in here. Twenty seven point seven mole water divided by twenty seven point seven mole plus X mole glucose. Okay. Now we solve for this moles of glucose. Right. So you take this term over here. So this times that plus this times that. So I don't have to do the calculation roughly by hand. So this times that is 26.536. This one times this one. And this one times that one is 0 0.9573. That's equal to 27.7. So if we take this one over here, subtract it from both sides, then we get 0 0.9573. This one minus that one. Which is four. Mm, let's get the step back. Okay. Everybody caught up with me? 27.7 minus okay, this is 1.164. Now x equals 1.164 divided by 0 0.95. Equals one point two one four moles of glucose. Now that we know moles of glucose, we can use uh, one hundred eighty times. So I was making it harder than it had to be. This is much simpler. Believe it or not. <laughs> it all boils down to two things. What's the mole fraction? You need to ratio these two. Right? You have to know that. Find the mole fraction of water. Then what is the mole fraction equal? Well, it's the moles of water per moles of solution. So if it's the moles of water per moles of solution, what is the solution made of? Well, it's moles of water and moles of glucose. So we say, all right, I need to know how many moles of water there are. Well, it's given to you, 500 grams of water. 500 grams of water is equal to 27.7 moles. Okay, so now you can Then the rest of it is straightforward. Half a lab, isn't it? Okay. okay.
you take a bathroom break and then as soon as you go in there we've got uh, I got two setups the first bench was taken up by some of uh, MLT's stuff for our show and tell on Friday so we're moved to bench two and three so just uh, I don't know if we picked lab partners yet um, but Whichever it happens to be, go to your bench and make sure your water is boiling. I started at heating, but it may not be uh, hot enough yet. Turn the knob up. Turn the knob, right. Here's two dollars for mine. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Drop something? No, my bag. Something like, I guess something in my bag, like my laptop or something, like the chair and the thing on the Hazmat suits coming out, baby. A few. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to say. Right now, it's even number. It's even that. It's not even numbers. Okay. Well, I mean, not yet. Not Lecture's yet. over. Not in the, in the future. It's not. Um, I so you'll have to check with your lab partners. Get the information so you can write the report. Okay, I can do that. Right. Thank you. Bye. Bye.